one of the most beloved titles for our Lord is the Lamb of God. Who's afraid of a lamb? If we went out at night and in the darkness found ourselves bumping into a body, we might well be scared. But looking down, we see a lamb. No one's afraid of a lamb. Christ is the most approachable being in the whole universe when we get to know him as he is. And so his name as the Lamb of God is found all the way through scripture, climaxing in the book of Revelation where he's referred to 28 times, four times seven, the Lamb of God in the last book of scripture. We were just looking at the story of Isaac being offered on Moriah and it climaxed with the words, God himself will provide a lamb for a burnt offering. Here's the lamb prophesied. And this is one of seven symbolic presentations of the lamb from Genesis to Revelation. First of all, you have the lamb typified when Abel takes the firstling of his flock and offers it as a sacrifice. Here we have Calvary prefigured. This story is the lamb typified. Genesis 22 is the lamb prophesied. God himself will provide a lamb for the burnt offering. When we turn to Exodus 12 and the lamb is slain and the blood is applied, here we see the lamb's blood applied. And moving on to the middle of scripture, we read of one who's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a lamb before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. Here's the lamb personified. Isaiah 53. Then in John 1 and verse 29, and John the Baptist points to Christ and says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb is now identified. It's Jesus of Nazareth. Revelation chapter 5 we have a sevenfold ascription of praise as the lamb at the throne is magnified. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to bring honor and glory and praise and strength and riches and so on. The lamb magnified. That's Revelation chapter 5. And then at the very close of scripture, the city has no need of the sun. For the Lord God and the Lamb are the light of it. Here the Lamb is glorified. So think of these seven presentations in symbolic settings of Jesus as the Lamb of God. Genesis 4, the Lamb typified his death, Abel's Lamb. And next we have the Lamb prophesied, Genesis 22. God will provide the Lamb, we couldn't. The next is 12, the lamb's blood applied. And when I see that blood, I'll pass over you. And then in Isaiah 53, he's brought as a lamb to the slaughter. The lamb personified. And then in the New Testament, in the fourth gospel, in the first chapter, the lamb is identified as Jesus. Behold, the lamb of God. Take away the sin of the world. And then it reaches a magnificent climax in Revelation where the Lamb is magnified in chapter 5 and glorified in chapter 22. Such is the Lamb throughout Scripture. Now we're going to look at another Genesis character. And this is one of the most fascinating of all Scripture. The story of Joseph. I'm going to turn to Genesis 37. <clears throat> like a rainbow out of a stormy sky comes the story of one man that fills the last 13 chapters of the first book of the Bible. And what a story. What a climax. We say a rainbow out of a storm-filled sky because hitherto even God's saints are all spotty. Adam rebels. Noah gets drunk. Abraham lies. Isaac gives evidences of weakness. Jacob deceives his father and then we come to a man who's given 13 times more space than the whole story of creation. 13 chapters. 
and against him no sin is recorded. Now, of course, he was a sinner like you and me. But because the Holy Spirit wants to make him a beautiful type of the sinless one, Christ, there's no sin recorded in the life of Joseph. Even when he brings a report about his brother's ill behaviour, never condemned as a sin in Scripture, he was just testifying in a right manner about behaviour that must be stopped. And there's nowhere in, in the whole story any shadow on this man. I want you to think of a synopsis of his life. A despised and rejected Jew is betrayed, tempted, falsely accused, entombed in prison, then becomes the saviour of the world. Have you got that little synopsis? A despised, rejected Jew betrayed for pieces of silver to a foreign nation, then condemned by the Gentiles for something he never did, and then delivered, and then he becomes the saviour of the world with the bread of life. What a story! I'm reading from Genesis 37. <clears throat> verse 2 Joseph being 17 years old was shepherding the flock with his brothers then it says in verse 3 Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age made him a long robe with sleeves when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers they hated him they couldn't speak peaceably to him now Joseph had a dream when he told it to his brethren, they only hated him the more. He said, hear this dream. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and my sheaf arose and stood upright. Behold, your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to it. And his brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? So here is a son, a beloved son, son of Jacob's old age. The Hebrew uses expressions ancient of days which in, Genesis, in Daniel chapter 7 is applied to God. So here an ancient of days, an old man, Jacob, has a much beloved son and he's meant to have the preeminence. That's the symbolism of the dream. His sheaf is higher, taller, and all the other sheaves bow down. But his brothers hate him. Remember, wherever you have a character given a lengthy description, is a type of Christ, wherever there are brothers, they hate him. Abel's brother hates him. Isaac's brother Ishmael hates him. David's brothers hate him. We understand it when we come to the New Testament. It says he came unto his own and his own received him not. It tells us in John's Gospel, neither did his brethren believe in him. Notice how that parable finished, the parable of the dream. <coughs> the brother said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? In Luke 19 and verse 14, you read the words, we won't have this man to reign over us. And over and over in this story, doesn't matter how many times you read it, you find the very words of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. Spurgeon said that if you read the story of Joseph 20 times, it will burst out living waters of the gospel you've never seen before. And we will notice that words like, come unto me, they sat down and watched him there, sold him for pieces of silver, bow the knee, all power on the land is given to you. Again and again and again, the words of the New Testament are found in this magnificent story that climaxes the Bible's first book. Verse 11 said his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the saying in mind. In Mark 15 and verse 10 about Christ, it says he was delivered for envy. And that's what happened to Joseph. And when we read this line, his father kept the saying in mind, remember Luke 2.51, his mother kept the saying in her heart. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. This is Genesis 37.12. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I'll send you to them. And he said to, the, to him, 
here I am. So he said to him, go now, see if it be well with your brothers and with the flock. Bring me word again. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the field. And the man asked him, what are you seeking? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Luke 20 and verse 13, the vineyard owner says, I'll send them my beloved son. And here you have in verse 13, come, I'll send you. And the reply is, here I am. Psalm 40 and verse 7, lo, I come. Lo, I come. Went from the valley of Hebron, that means fellowship. Went into the land of Shechem, that means service. And a man found him wandering in the fields. The Bible in the New Testament says the field is the world and foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests. But the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Christ came a wanderer from heaven to this exiled earth for our sakes. What are you seeking? The man asked him. I'm seeking my brothers. Then in verse 18, they saw him afar off. And before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. Again and again in the New Testament we read, they took counsel against him to slay him. We'll see what will become of his dreams. But Reuben said, and here he acts like Pilate, trying to protect him, shed no blood, cast him into this pit, don't lay a hand upon him. Pilate tried to save Jesus. But when Joseph came, they stripped him of his robe. Over and over in the story of the antitype, Christ is stripped of his robe by Herod's men, by Pilate's men. Once when he's given a purple robe, once when he's to be flogged, and again when he's at Calvary. He's stripped. He's stripped. And they stripped Joseph of his robe. And they cast him into a pit. The prophetic Psalms talk about death as a pit. And that's where Christ went for us. Then it says they sat down to eat. And when you read the story of Calvary in Matthew 27 and verse 36, 36, it says, sitting down, they watched him there. Then you have the story of Judah saying, let's sell him. And Judah engineers the selling of, Christ, of Joseph, the type of Christ, for shekels of silver to a foreign nation as Judas, three millenniums later, would have Christ or 30 pieces of silver that the Romans might crucify him. Then in verse 31, they took Joseph's robe and killed a goat, dipped the robe in the blood and they brought it to the father. The story climaxes with the Midianite sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the guard. Then the story is interrupted and people have wondered why chapter 38 is there. It tells the story of another brother of the same family, tempted morally, and guilty of incest. Then in the next chapter, 39, Joseph is tempted sexually and refuses so that we might see that our Lord, though he took our nature, though he is tempted in all points like as we are, was without sin. He had to be perfect to be a sacrifice for our sins. So now Joseph is in Egypt and he's condemned by the Gentiles. You see how it reap is an uh, anticipation of the replay we have in the Gospels. The Jews condemn him, Sanhedrin, Caiaphas. Then the Gentiles condemn him. Pontius Pilate delivers him to be crucified. So in this story, the Jewish brothers sell him, hand him over, betray him. Then Potiphar, a Gentile, condemns him and he's entombed in an Egyptian prison. And the story is taken up in the 39th chapter. Joseph was taken down to Egypt and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, bought him. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was in the house of his master. His master saw the Lord was with him, that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. Here you see one man blessed for the sake of another. That's the essence of the gospel. One man blessed, the sinner, for the sake of another the sinless one. Here we see someone who took the form of a servant and that's what Christ did. Joseph becomes a servant to Potiphar and Christ is described as a servant of rulers. 
The master saw the Lord was with him. Christ said, the Father hasn't left me alone. He that sent me is with me. The Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. Isaiah 53, 10 says, the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. Potiphar made him overseer of his house, put him in charge of all that he had. John 3.35 says, God has put all things into the hand of Christ. The Lord bless the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. Ephesians 1.3 says, we are blessed with all spiritual blessings for the sake of Christ. He left all that he had in Joseph's charge because Joseph was able to keep it. Paul could say later, I'm trusting in him who's able to keep. Then it has an unusual statement. At the end of verse 6 of this 39th chapter, Joseph was handsome and good looking. Very rarely does the Bible give a description, a physical description, because if it said the person was black, the whites would feel out. If it said the person was white, the blacks would feel out. If it said the person was tall, it wouldn't appeal to the shorties. If it said the person was short, it wouldn't appeal to those who are tall. So the Bible rarely gives a description, but it does of this man and it does of David, and for the same reason, they represent the one altogether lovely, the chiefest among 10,000, the lily of the valley and the rose of Sharon. So Joseph's described as handsome, and good-looking. And when we come to the story of David, we'll find a similar description given of him. His response to temptation is, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? But she caught him by his garment. And you find the garment referred to at least five times in the following verses. Clothing's very significant in typology. All the way through to the cross where the crucified one gives his clothing to his crucifiers. And there you have the heart of the gospel. Christ gives us, by imputation, his character, his righteousness. It's not for nothing that all the way through Genesis, beginning with Adam and Eve losing their garment of light, being clothed with skins, coming on to the climax in Genesis of garment, 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 repeated over and over again in connection with Joseph because he points to the one who, when crucified, gave his robe not to his friends, but to his crucifiers. Because there's a sense in which whatever we are now, originally, every one of us has been a crucifier of Christ. The story continues in the 39th chapter that the master puts him into a prison where the king's prisoners are confined and says again, the Lord was with Joseph. And now it says that the jailer doesn't need to worry about anything that was in Joseph's care because the Lord was with him. Whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. So here the words of the prophecy of Isaiah are found in type. The pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. In chapter 40, we have a parable of this whole world and its offenders. We find people waiting for judgment, imprisoned, and then another comes who's innocent, who brings salvation one who is an interpreter, one who has no guilt and yet is numbered with the transgressors. And in the next chapter, we'll see particularly the innocent sufferer allied with two others in pain and one of them is saved and the other lost. Everybody knows the story of the butler and the baker. And one is saved because of Joseph, but the other is lost. Prefigures the three crosses on Calvary. The two thieves with our Lord and his suffering, one is saved and the other is lost. Joseph gave an admonition to the man who would be saved. Remember me when it's well with you. Do me this kindness. Make mention of me. Get me out of this house. I've done nothing. Christ told the story once and he finished it by saying, Inasmuch as you do it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you do it unto me. Be kind, says Christ, be kind. If you're kind to others, you're being kind to me. So here Joseph says, do me this kindness. Remember me. And our Lord said, do this in remembrance of me. Then the climax comes that will bring his deliverance. In chapter 41, 
the butler had forgotten all about Jesus. Pharaoh dreams a dream and there comes out of the Nile seven cows sleek and fat and they fed in the reed grass and then seven other cows gaunt and thin and they eat up the fat cows. Then he has a repeat dream about ears of corn that are plump and good being swallowed up by seven ears thin and blighted. And Pharaoh's troubled. He wants someone to interpret his dream. Then the butler remembers. And he says, I remember my faults this day. He's like the saved thief who said on the cross, this man is innocent. We receive the just reward of our deeds. So the penitent thief was penitent. And now the butler's penitent. He says, I have done wrong. There is a man who can help Pharaoh. Verse 14, the Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. They brought him hastily out of the dungeon. When he'd shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. Please observe, he left his clothes in the prison. And when our Lord finished the atonement, you remember on the third day, Peter and John run to the tomb, the prison of Christ, for three days. They look in and Christ is not there, but his clothes are there. A reflection of Leviticus 16, 23, where it says that the high priest on the day of atonement, when he finishes the work of atonement, he shall leave his clothes behind. So Joseph left his clothes in prison. Typical of Jesus, who on the time of his deliverance, left behind him the symbol of his righteousness, which is his gift to all of us. So Pharaoh talks to Joseph and praises him, and Joseph says, well, it's not in me. And that reminds us of Christ saying he could do nothing of himself. But he does interpret. And finally, Pharaoh says, can we find a man like this in whom is the Spirit of God? Remember Acts 10, 38, the Lord anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, verse 39, God has shown you all this. There's none so discreet and wise as you are. Remember Colossians 2, 3, says that Christ is filled with all the treasures of wisdom. So now it's said about Joseph, there's none so wise as you are. You'll be over my house. My people shall order themselves as you command. I've set you over all the land. And when you come to the Great Commission, Christ says, all power in the land is given unto me. He was arrayed in garments of fine linen, and people cried before him, bow the knee. And you know the statement of the Philippians, under him, Christ, every knee shall bow. And then it says that Joseph sits on the throne with Pharaoh, reminding us of what Revelation says, where in the letters to the churches, Christ says, I'm set down on my father's throne. And if you will trust me, you'll sit with me on my throne. Then in verse 45, Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. In Matthew 4, 33, and in Matthew 9, 35, that same expression is used about Jesus. He went over all the land preaching. And verse 46 says he was 30 years old when this happened. Isn't that amazing? Joseph is 30 years old when he begins his special ministry pointing forward to our Lord, who was anointed when he was 30 years old. He piles up the treasure houses. Again, we think of the references in the New Testament that in Christ are all the treasures. He's married to a Gentile wife, typical of our Lord Jesus, marrying a church made up from all the world. He's given a new name. His name is the Revealer of Secrets. And my friends, all the things we want to know are in Jesus. All the things that mount, matter most. How to get rid of my guilt. How to live. What the future holds. How I can learn more about Christ. What the Holy Spirit can do for me. How I can know his presence from day to day. Experience his benediction from hour to hour. Jesus is the true revealer of secrets. So what have we said? We said the Bible closes with 13 chapters about one sinless man, a man who to begin with is a despised Jew who's betrayed by his own brothers, Jewish brothers, then condemned by the Gentiles, is entombed, 
And in his trouble, he's with two other sufferers and one is saved and the other lost. Then he rises to be Lord over all the land and Saviour of the world.